the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Joining us again is a special guest, Sprott's Rick Rule. Rick, thanks for joining us again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. All right. Well, it's uh, been a bit of a consolidation this week for gold and silver, but let's get started right off here, Rick. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question kind of on the macro side with gold and silver. A couple of months ago, I believe, you made some comments that we hadn't yet really seen a washout bottom in gold, silver, or the miners. So uh, what's your take right now? Are you still looking for a washout bottom to come, or are we actually, in effect, already witnessing the early stages of the next bull move? Well, I would feel much more comfortable if we saw a capitulation sell-off, simply because that, to me, would be a clear demarcation that we were at the end of a bear market. That's the way a couple of bear markets that I've experienced before in my life have, in fact, ended. But, of course, uh, there's no God-given law that says that we have to have a capitulation sell-off. And it would appear to me, uh, with regards to, in particular, the junior mining equities, that the bear market appears to be over. Uh, I have noticed real signs of strength in the sort of top 10 or 20 percent of the junior mining equities. I notice that news is again beginning to move stocks, uh, not just in the gold and silver equities, but also in uh, uranium equities. I notice that a good discovery hole at Mariana causes the entire float to turn over and the share price to double. Uh, So my suspicion is that we are now in the early stages of recovery. It just doesn't feel like recovery because the GDXJ is still populated with sort of 60% of the listings being zombies, companies with working capital deficits and no real reason to exist. But if you segregate the exchange qualitatively, my suspicion is that the best part of the TSXV uh, is through the bear market and into the early stages of a bull market. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, early in like uh, October, November of last year, and looking at the volume turnover for almost at least like 70 some odd percent of most miners, it seemed like that it was running for a two month, three month period, even by November, at an 80 percent level above year over year levels. And it looked like it was kind of a stealth capitulation beyond just advanced tax law selling. And with this four-plus-year-long bear market that just has been grinding and the addition of the manipulation and layers on top of that, and uh, it, it seemed like this time around, uh, because of the somewhat unnatural nature of this bear being as long duration as it has been with the manipulation layered on top, that we had kind of a stealth capitulation. Do you think that there's much merit into that theory as to you know, analyzing with now what is 2020 hindsight, what well, happened with the miners? It, it's very interesting that you say that. When I look back to the be- late September, early October last year, I thought it wasn't going to be a stealth capitulation. It was starting to look like we were going to head to the real thing. Uh, that yeah. didn't happen. It, it, it's interesting that you asked me that question. I put the same question to my good friend Ross Beatty, a fairly successful mining guy, as you know, not too long ago. I said, so Ross, do you think you've, you've hit the, we've hit the bottom? He says, Rick, I don't really care. Uh, If we're going to put in a bottom, it's 10 or 15 or maybe 20% below where we are. But if you juxtapose how much lower it can go with how much higher it's going to go, it doesn't matter if we're at the bottom or not. And this is interesting because, you know, Ross isn't out there promoting companies anymore. He's a large shareholder in a couple of companies, but he, what he's really doing is writing checks in other people's companies. And he is a very active private placement investor right now. And from his point of view, as I say, he says, you know, whether or not we're at the bottom, past the bottom, or approaching the bottom doesn't much matter. Because if you juxtapose the downside risk with the upside reward, that juxtaposition of risk to reward is so stupidly in your favor. <laughs> That defining a bottom is a waste of time. And Ross, as he has so often been in my life, I think is exactly correct. So speaking about the bifurcation in the marketplace with you know more than 50% zombie companies, but the really choice companies with great properties, good management, good prospects, they're, they're getting financing far more so now. And I wonder if you can 
speak to the catbird seat that you have and see what's going on in the market and, and share with our listeners and readers what you see? Well, you know, this reminds me an awful lot of 2000, uh, the epicenter of the last bear market bottom. And in the middle of that year, in July in particular, the best people in the market decided, understood that companies without cash flow couldn't save their way to prosperity, that they had to build their projects out. And they raised money, however painful it was, and they began to build. And that took us very, very, very quickly into a good market. And you're saying, this, you're saying the same circumstance now. Companies, as an example, like Kamenak, uh, have decided it's painful to raise money now. But we have to answer the unanswered questions around our deposit to add value. We have to add oxide ounces. We have to add transition ounces. We have to prove that we can get good metallurgical recovery in transition ounces. And just doing that has led, despite the fact that they've had to issue more shares, to a much stronger market. You move on to uh, Bob Quartermain fairly recently selling 10% of Predium to Zijin, the large peristatal company, uh, and having the stock go up as a consequence of the issuance. Robert Friedland being able to issue 10% of Ivanhoe also to, D to Zijin. At a 25% premium to market, it's interesting to note that these extremely sophisticated investors, Zijin Mining is the largest non-ferrous metals mining, and comp mining company in China, and Sprott works with them. We know them to be sophisticated. Uh, it's interesting that on-market retail investors uh, aren't often willing to pay the market price for stocks, and some very sophisticated investors are willing to pay 25% premiums. These are all of the hallmarks of a market that wants to go higher, where the money isn't coming from the lame, the halt, and the blind but in fact is coming from the strongest and most knowledgeable money around the market. On a related note in mining share uh, markets, have you noticed anything or heard of people speak about the value of owning mining shares as a hedge against monetary uh, transformations, collapse, you know, more focused on those particular reasons for having the hedge and insurance value of owning mining shares? And I reflect on that in part because of the possibility of all of the various transitions that might come with maybe uh, the elevation of the SDR basket as a more important liquidity pump internationally and possible uh, you know, restrictions on uh, individual holding of bullion in various countries or possibly even the United States, uh, increasing uh, excess profit taxes, quote-unquote, on bullion and, and so on. And uh, you, know, you know, I reflect as well on James Turk speaking as early as 2004 about how many sovereign wealth uh, funds and high net worth investors in, in incrementally taking a larger percentage interest in their portfolios for equity holdings because of the ability for, say, and Turk's uh, frequent example, an Exxon can easily transition to the next monetary order. I'm wondering if you hear any discussion in the background about uh, the investment thesis of high net worth individuals or maybe even uh, from the great line sovereign wealth funds uh, thinking about the concept of stocks in that context. And you know, even this week it was uh, discovered in the disclosures for the Swiss National Bank that they scarfed up $10 billion of uh, U.S. equities in the quarter ending March 15th per their reporting. So there's definitely a heck of a lot more interest in equities as a uh, asset class, uh, far more so than bonds, particularly in our uh, you know, world now with zero and even negative interest rates on bonds and, and on and on. So I would like you to just you know, ponder that and speak to it. Have you, have you seen anything that speaks to people who are maybe even new money coming into mining shares because of these dynamics? Well, that's a complex question that I think um – had three parts. Yeah. Uh, the first part of the question, as I understood it, uh, was uh, had I heard a case expressed that mining shares might be part of a response 
to investors' fears with regards to uh, manipulation and a destabilization of the existing financial order. Uh, I have clients that express that point of view. My own point of view is different. My own point of view is that if we have a Wall Street-inspired um, liquidity collapse, if we have the set of circumstances that we exp experienced in 2008, that the first response to that will be that mining stocks are stocks and that the selling that takes place won't necessarily be driven by the client, it'll be driven by the margin clerk. And in a, in a circumstance like that, I don't think that you would want to own an indirect gold proxy like a gold mining share. I think you'd like to own gold. And certainly my own personal portfolio is well hedged for higher gold prices through both, through both equities and the gold. But the insurance part of my portfolio, which goes to the first part of your question, uh, I think uh, goes to either bullion or the very high quality bullion substitutes where you know that the um, certificated gold is in place with people that you know and love and trust. With regards to the second part of your question, which is there an increasing attraction among very high net worth institutionals, institutions, pardon me, and individuals, and in fact, sovereign wealth funds to gold equities? I think the answer there is an unconstrained yes. I think there's a realization uh, among ultra high net worth individuals that gold equities are an under owned asset class relative to other asset classes. And I think that there is an increasing understanding among very sophisticated investors that the gold mining industry itself is beginning to heal itself from some of the sins that have punished it so badly over the last decade. Uh, bad investment decisions, uh, extraordinarily high general administrative expenses, uh, you are beginning to see companies, as an example, Rand Gold or Franco Nevada, that would be re regarded as well-run businesses in any industry. And I think that there is beginning to be an understanding among very sophisticated investors that's separate and apart from the fact that the industry stands to benefit from higher precious metals prices, that it stands to benefit from internally generated improvements in the business which is a good thing. The third part of the question, as I understood it, is, is there beginning to be a flight from bonds into equity as a consequence of negative real yields? And, and I think that's a much more sophisticated question. I think that the, the negative real yields are a function both of the manipulation of the interest rate and the in manipulation of the government securities markets by sovereigns. Uh, I, I, I mean, they acknowledge it, so why shouldn't I? But I also think that very, very, very low, very high bond prices, very low bond ye uh, yields are a function of some of the biggest money in the world also being afraid of equities prices and uh, an equities market decline. When you say to people, why on earth are you satisfied with 150 basis point negative real yield? The response I occasionally get is, uh, I think that losing one and a half percent is better than losing 20 or 25 percent. And I've gone there for safety. So I, I think that the, uh, that discussion cuts both ways. I think that the very low interest rates are forcing investors, uh, in, investors of all sizes, into equities, including to a very limited degree mining equities. But I also think that part of the reason the center, the sovereigns, can get away with negative real yields is that some people are so afraid of other asset classes that they would rather park themselves in sovereigns. That's not just garden and variety financial depression, but fear of deflationary crashes to just generic stock market valuations. Even dear Janet Yellen was out this week talking about <laughs> the stock valuations are generally quite high, quote-unquote. Very unusual for her to make statements like that. 
<laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I, I have no real comment other than, you know, I, I usually take investment advice from people who have had a job. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think she's well-intentioned, and I think she's very smart. Um, you know, I, I really have a problem uh, either taking investment advice from or having my money indirectly run by somebody who's only produced studies for a living. Um, I assume her to be a well-meaning and intel intelligent person. Uh, certainly, she has spectacular political skills, but I'm troubled by the fact that she's never had to do something like make a payroll or produce right. a product. Uh, I was going to say I don't want that to be a criticism. It's a criticism, um, but I think it's a well-founded criticism. And I happen, frankly, to agree with her conclusion. And I guess I shouldn't argue with the conclusion because of my problem with the messenger. But it interests me uh, how much care and attention people with more appropriate skill sets pay to Janet Yellen when her skill sets are, at least from my point of view, suspect, given the subject that she's talking about. Yeah, and, I, and, and her track record was, was spoken of very highly when she was assuming office, but a fair read of it is at best mixed. Uh, but that's another story altogether. Before we dive into other subjects, I just want to ask you a real quick question as far as uh, what your clients are doing when it comes to their purchases of stock and specifically, have you had a lot of clients request that their shares not be held within a financial uh, in, uh, account, but rather in street name, I mean, excuse me, not in street name, but in uh, the corporate registrar or maybe even just the issuance of share certificates directly for the specific purchase, uh, the specific purpose of, you know, not having being you know, exposed to an MF global style type of situation where a financial institution falls apart and their assets become uh, sequestered. Yeah, we have had some, some customers order out their securities. We've cautioned them that particularly with regards to foreign securities, if they conspire to lose them, <laughs> there's yeah. hell to pay <laughs> over that. We have asked our clients to consider uh, who the fiduciary is that they hold their shares with. That's fairly self-serving. Uh, many Wall Street institutions operate their businesses on 7 or 8% equity slices. At Sprott, we operate our business on a 100% equity slice. Uh, so you have a lot less counterparty risk. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we are introducing brokers for a clearing firm, RBC Dane, that's a wholly owned subsidiary of the Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, at the parent level, the Royal Bank of Canada is unusually well financed for a global bank. And at the operating subsidiary level, RBC Dane has an unusually strong balance sheet for a clearing firm. So we have asked the clients who have expressed concerns of the type that you describe to consider the financial institution that they're holding their shares with before they order out the paper. So let's switch gears a bit, and why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on with spots of interest in the central fund? Yeah, uh, to start with, it isn't uh, the central fund itself that we have announced our intention to tender for. It's the New York Stock Exchange Traded Trusts, the Central Gold Trust and, and the Physical Silver Trust. Right. Um, those products have been on the market for the better part of a decade and have continued to trade uh, occasionally at very subst substantial discounts to net asset value. And it was, in fact, the architecture of those products and the complaints concerning those products in the market that caused us to form our own products, the Sprott Physical Gold, Physical Silver, and Physical Platinum and Palladium Trusts. And our products and their products uh, differ in several fairly substantial ways. The first is that our products are, in certain circumstances, redeemable for physical precious metals, where theirs are not. The fact that ours are redeemable for physical precious metals has meant that our products never sell at any appreciable discount to net asset value because if that happens, the arbitrageurs come in and arbitrage away the discount. 
And the third difference is that the manager of the Sprott products is Sprott, a completely transparent manager because we're public. Our balance sheet and our income statement are readily available. The Spicer family who runs the central fund, because they're private, have chosen not to publish their financials. And I'm not trying to say that there's anything wrong with their financials. I'm just trying to say that they're opaque, they're transparent. And you can't tell whether or not they're solvent or whether or not they're not solvent. You don't know enough about your manager to feel completely comfortable about the nature of the management. The consequences of those uh, three factors, I think, uh, led uh, some institutional investors in the central trust products to requisition a meeting of the shareholders for the purposes, for the purpose of uh, changing the nature of the central fund product to, to have them mimic our product. When we saw that, what we decided is that it would be much more efficient for everyone concerned if the holders of their product simply tendered for our product, that the differences in the product would, of course, go away. Then their units would be our units. They would be redeemable. The discount would go away. And the question uh, with regards to opacity or transparency with regard to the manager would also go away. Uh, we will be, we think, in the fairly uh, short time frame, begin the process of an offer for the assets of those funds. And we would ask those listeners of yours who are holders of that product to ask themselves whether they wanted a product that mo much more closely mimicked the underlying gold and silver markets that didn't trade at substantial discounts that were redeemable and one where you had the advantage of knowing completely and certainty, certainly, pardon me, the financial condition of the manager of your investment product. And if the answer to those three questions is yes, of course, I would ask your listeners to consider our bid very, uh, very carefully because I think that we address the only three relevant questions in the discussion. Changing gears a little bit here, Rick, um, I'd like to get your take here, um, especially with the action we've seen in the markets the past 48 hours with regards to the on-again, off-again, Fed speak to interest rates. <laughs> Do you think we'll actually see uh, any meaningful interest rate hikes come September? Will we see maybe one or two small quarter point hikes and, and that's it just so the Fed can say, see, uh, see we hiked them like we said? What's your, what's your outlook and take? I hope so. I think that the current interest rate environment in the United States is despicable. We have made a policy decision to steal from savers to subsidize spenders. And I think it's immoral and I think it's inefficient. Not that any of the people who have the power to make that decision care particularly with what I think. Uh, given that it's the right thing to do, I think it's highly unlikely that it will occur. I believe that the current interest rate environment is popular on Wall Street because it subsidizes the carry trade. Uh, I think it's convenient for the majority of Americans who haven't bothered to provision for their own well-being. And I think it's also problematic for federal, state, and local governments that have debts to service. Uh, obviously, they would like their interest uh, costs to be as low as possible. So given the fact that there would be some fairly powerful oxen that got gored by interest rate increase, I don't think it will occur. And I don't see any particularly widespread clamoring for an increase in interest rates. I think the simple fact that it's the right thing to do doesn't matter too much to the people who have the ability to make the decision. On the economic front, we have a mixed uh situation and, uh, you know, the, the job boning that we see coming out of the Fed when it comes to interest rates also corresponds to what asset prices are doing any given week and the song and dance that they do in terms of trying to manage expectations about interest rates. We, you know, just a moment ago, we were talking about Jenny Yellen talking about high asset valuation in the stock market, and that could very well be tied to some kind of consideration of trying to tame animal spirits in advance of an attempt to raise interest rates. Long end, too, is again, uh, some interest as well as far as, you know, moving up regardless of what the Fed does on the short end. So, um, you know, in the 
context of what's going on economically, we've had a lot of reports in the last couple of months that are kind of stinky, frankly, a highly technical term. And <laughs> it just, yeah, it, it looks like the economy is, in the very least, rolling over. And then when you look at particular segments, uh, you know, international trade, containerized shipping out of uh, China, uh, the Baltic Dry Index, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, there's a lot of indication that the economy has hit a massive speed bump at best. What's your take about where we are economically, both U.S. and international? I think, I think in the U.S., um, our economy has bifurcated too. Uh, there are parts of the economy, uh, the parts like technology as an example, where the U.S. adds value and where U.S. participation has utility. They're doing extremely well. Uh, I know with regards to Sprott, there are several positions that we're trying to fill, and we cannot fill them, but these are skilled positions. So the people and companies that add value are doing extraordinarily well in this, in this climate. But for most Americans, uh, the fact that they increasingly have to compete in a global economy and they have to compete with foreign workers who do the job as well as they do for less money. The introduction to the global reality has been very unpleasant for a coddled American population. And I, I think there's a lot more adjustment to come. I agree with your assertion that the broad U.S. economy is hitting a speed bump. Uh, it is a speed bump that has to do with a few things. Uh, many years of soft money and low interest rates forward shifted demand. Uh, eight years ago, we used up demand that should have been experienced six years ago. And six years ago, we used up demand that should have been used up four years ago and so on. So that much of the benefit of stimulus has already worked its way through the economy and increasing amounts of stimulus yield decreasing benefits. The second thing is that one part of the U.S. economy that was beginning to show signs of life a couple years ago was the U.S. manufacturing sector. And you don't aid the U.S. manufacturing se sector by having the dollar increase by 23 or 24 percent, making your goods precisely 23 or 24 percent more expensive in local terms than they had been. And I guess the third thing that needs to be noted with regards to the U.S. economy is that while ultimately low energy prices will be a wonderful for thing for the U.S. economy, in the interim, in terms of wage growth, what we've done is reverse wage growth in the one private sector that had exhibited spectacular wage growth for low-skilled and semi-skilled workers, that is the oil and gas producing sector. So while I think that there is a dividend that will flow through the American economy from lower energy prices, the equivalent of a massive tax cut, uh, in the interim, we're going to feel the pain, particularly in very strong regional markets like North Dakota, Wyoming, and Texas, from wage decreases in a sector that was one of the few bright spots in the private economy. On a global basis, I'm actually seeing some signs of life. Uh, one anecdotal piece of information has been, uh, again, Zijin Mining, the largest uh, non-ferrous metals mining company in China and controlled by the Chinese state, making a pretty large investment a couple of weeks ago in Ivanhoe Mining to, uh, one would assume, gain access to supplies of respectively copper, zinc, and platinum and palladium. That would seem to say that the people that run China are beginning to believe it's game on for materials acquisition, again, after a two-year period where it was very much game off for them. Uh, it, that and other data points tell me that the Chinese perception of the Chinese economy is that they are seeing light at the end of the tunnel um, and that they are beginning to work through the period of misallocation of resources 
particularly re with regards to real estate construction uh, and development, and that uh, in increasing private sector investment in export-oriented industries and also increasing investment in infrastructure is beginning to lead the Chinese material sector into a bit of a recovery. It may be too early to say this definitively, but I'm looking at their actions as opposed to their words. By them, I mean the Chinese, and that's constructing a fairly bullish picture as far as I see it for the Chinese economy. That makes sense, and there's also been some rumors floating around about uh, the Chinese central bank possibly doing their own version of QE if things do stall out further. So that would probably put an afterburner in the commodities market in general. And the uh, one indicator of that has been the extraordinary performance of the Chinese equity market, <laughs> which I suggest is being done in speculative expectation of precisely what you suggested. People saw the response of European equity markets and Japanese equity markets to, count, call it what it is, counterfeiting. And the expectation is that if there's an increase in Chinese counterfeiting, that that will continue to drive the Chinese equity markets. And for the benefit of our listeners who may not have been following it, the A shares in Shanghai have doubled in six months. I mean, it's just a phenomenal movement in there market. Along with massive increases in the retail investor uh, accounts, uh, I was seeing a chart a couple of days ago that was just um, showed an astronomical um, increase in brand newly opened uh, retail investor accounts. Hey, Rick, you were talking a bit about uh, the oil sector in context of jobs. What do you see overall as far as uh, you know where the shale industry is, what's going on with possibly uh, their exposure to the junk debt financing and the overhang of that. I mean, I've seen estimates of upwards of about 20, excuse me, $200 billion of financial exposure to junk bond financing in the shale industry that most likely doesn't have the cash flows now given the prevailing prices to support that and the precarious position of a lot of players. Uh, and then, you know, 12, 18 months out, uh, you know, where do you see oil going in the context of the shale Implosion and the price decline that we've seen. Well, this to me is the most interesting subject in the resource investment business. the The headline of this discussion ought to be "Markets Work." the yeah. cure, The cure for high prices, and somebody needs to tell Congress this, is high prices. And the cure for low prices will be low prices. We had very high real energy prices for a very long time, and you'll remember the Congress was clamoring to do something about it. Mercifully, they're very inefficient, and so while they were deciding what to do, the market took care of it all by itself. Uh, the high prices led to a series of technological innovations that doubled production in the most overdrilled piece of real estate in the world, the United States. At the same time, that high prices led to the adoption of energy efficiency measures throughout the economy, which reduced demand. Um, increasing supply and reduced demand, what do you think happens? The price collapsed, and it did. Uh, it collapsed to the point where <laughs> oil now sells for less than the total cost of production, despite some of the lies of the companies to the contrary. And the market will take care of itself here, too. The cure for low prices will ultimately be low prices. You come out of a bear market and go into a bull market one of two ways, either demand creation or supply destruction. My own supposition is that the global economy is weak enough that demand creation won't occur in time and supply destruction will be responsible for the rebound in oil prices. Now, the interesting part about this is that the oil and gas industry was enormously overcapitalized and supply destruction won't take place for a while because companies will have the ability to cannibalize the capital that they either raised in capital markets or enjoyed from retained earnings. It'll take a couple of years, two or three years, to destroy productive capacity. But if the market is cured by supply destruction, what happens is that the ensuing correction will overshoot because as demand begins to increase, the ability of the industry to respond to that demand increase 
is diminished simply because they have decapitalized their producing operations and it takes a long time to gear back up. Your readers, many of them, will remember the old Pure Later auto filter commercial where a mechanic holds up an oil filter and says, you can pay me now, meaning $10 for an oil filter, or you can pay me later, meaning $1,500 for a blown engine. And that's the way these, remar- these resource markets work. If we get uh, demand recovery, we can make the oil and gas business work at $75 a barrel fairly easily. If we don't and we destroy productive capacity, then five years from now or six years from now, the oil price goes to $125 or $150. Now, to the second part of your question, the near-term economic and market fallout from this, we, we're going to see a delayed reaction. We aren't really going to see until the fourth quarter of 2015 and the first quarter of 2016 the real impact of uh, energy prices on energy equity and energy debt markets. We need to see two or three quarters of balance sheets and income statements reflecting a $55 reality after a $90 pro forma. We need to see in the third quarter of this year the third, the third party reserve estimates of the proved producing reserves on public company balance sheets. Uh, the write downs that are going to have to be taken when you value these assets at $50, $60 a barrel as opposed to at $90 a barrel are going to be pretty striking. And then you are going to have to look at the uh, debt markets and the bank's response to these new reserve calculations and the income statements and the balance sheets of the borrowers. And you're going to see situations where revolving credit facilities, that's a facility that's an interest-only facility that varies up and down depending on the valuations of proved developed producing assets, begin to either get called or get termed out, meaning that debt capital is, I think, going to become much more scarce in the fourth quarter of this year than the first quarter of next year. And I think that that'll play out in a number of ways. The over-leveraged juniors will respond, as they always do, by trying to sell their peripheral properties into a market where there's only sellers and no buyers, and the market for peripheral properties goes no bid. The banks are going to try and cause the third-party reserve valuations to employ fairly aggressive pricing strategies in the out years. Right now, they're 25% 25 above the prevailing strip. So as to avoid too many write-downs on their own um, balance sheets, which will cause for increasing provisioning and reduced bank profits. Uh, The real interesting thing to watch, well, I think that's going to be one interesting thing to watch, But another interesting thing to watch is going to be the response of the junk bond markets, where some of the less sophisticated analysts will still be able to calculate which companies have total indebtedness that exceeds the net present value of their assets. In other words, which of the existing oil and gas companies are in fact zombies. I think we're going to have a spectacular climate to invest in oil and gas in the fourth quarter of this year and the first quarter of next year because I suspect that the market response to sub-billion dollar oil companies will simply be oil bad uh, and they'll throw out the babies with the bathwater. And I, of course, hope personally to be there to pick up some of the better pieces, but I think it's going to be a very, very interesting time. I can tell you that this has occurred to me now, this will be the fourth time in my career that this has occurred to me. And the last two times it occurred to me, um, being educated enough to see it coming and being wealthy enough to take advantage was hugely beneficial for me. And uh, I look forward to this uh, now that I'm in my 60s and my declining years to have this be one final gift from Mr. Market to Mr. Rule. Have you, um, 
In your opinion, do you believe that there's any possible systemic risk when it comes to counterparty risk on the other side of uh, maybe concentrated holdings of this 200 some odd billion dollars of junk debt financing in the shale industry? No, I think that would be fairly limited. Um, I think aggregate debt of the uh, U.S. oil and gas business relative to total private debt in this economy is something like 4%. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that you could have you know, write downs that would be in the range of 25% of that. Uh, You certainly will have some leverage long hedge funds uh, that are going to go to hedge fund heaven. Uh, Good riddance as far as I'm concerned. Uh, You're going to have some, you know, investment bankers that enjoyed 20 or $30 million bonuses that are going to be thanked, thanked and excused and allowed to pursue other employment opportunities, which I think is good. Um, you are going to see uh, third-party lenders and even some first-party, even some chartered bank lenders that have to take some fairly substantial write-downs. But the truth is that these financial institutions right now are enjoying so much cash uh, as a consequence of extraordinarily low deposit rates, that they'll be able to weather the storm pretty easily. It may be that the uh, interim difficulties experienced by the lending community in the fourth quarter of this year and the first quarter of next year are used as one of the excuses to continue uh, subsidized low interest rates. But I don't see it as a particular cause of concern for the overall economy. I think that the lower energy prices that the benefit of lower energy prices throughout the economy will outweigh the difficulties that are experienced in the oil and gas business and in the oil and gas finance sector. Sprott, by the way, has lots of money available for oil companies, Uh, not enough to cure the ills of the entire industry, but the money that we would provide is, you know, sort of quasi-debt, quasi-equity. It's, it's, uh, it's offered up at LIBOR plus nine as opposed to LIBOR plus one and a half. In other words, it's priced to reflect the risk associated with industries that have traditionally been capital intensive and cyclical. Well, switching gears to uh, back to the precious metals, and it's probably the final subject we can hit on in great detail. I'm uh, curious to know what you think about what's going on with China and their reserve uh, holdings of gold they declared. 1,049 metric tons back in 2009, and there's been a lot of speculation, including um, a thesis that I've been advancing on our show about how it's in China's interest to declare uh, sometime this summer and perhaps maybe above Germany such that they would become known as the second largest gold holder, but maybe not revealing all of their cards and just coming in under 4,000 metric tons thereabouts. And uh, that being beneficial to their quest to be added to the SDR basket because they still have capital controls and their the yuan is not freely convertible and all the various typical things that go into uh, formal uh, qualifying status for SDR basket inclusion aren't quite there yet, even though the yuan is very well used internationally, now representing the second most uh, used currency for the transaction of goods and services. Um, you know, they're far, far away from any kind of... Um, parity with the U.S. dollar in terms of you know, dollar reserve um, status competition, obviously. But uh, there's a lot of speculation that China is seeking to become a member of the SDR basket this year. So what do you, what's your take on all of that? And do you think that it's probable that they'll declare their portion of their gold reserves this summer and in preparation of the SDR basket quest that they're trying to execute? If you give me 12 months as opposed to five months, Uh, I subscribe to your entire thesis. Um, I'm not a China expert, but Sprott has some very large Chinese investors who we talk to, and we study that market as a consequence of the fact that we'd like to have more large Chinese investors. And there are important elements in Chinese society and important elements in the Chinese uh, leadership that want to continually modernize China and have China be seen as a respected part of the world's economic leadership. Um, We have reason to believe, we don't know, but we have reason to believe 
that the Chinese state has been a consistent buyer of gold, uh, both for the reasons that you suggest and also because they're concerned about holding $1.2 trillion in U.S. treasuries and would yep. like some diversity in holdings. But the rest of your thesis, which is that the Chinese would like to be more important members of the global financial community, uh, and they would simply like to be seen as more transparent and more modern, tells me that there is an overwhelming probability that the circumstance that you describe is accurate for the reasons that you have described. Well, before we let you go, Rick, um, if you could uh, tell listeners, I believe you're um, in a couple of months holding the, the second annual uh, resource conference in Vancouver, if I'm correct. Thank you for reminding that, me of that. I'm normally commercial enough not to have to be reminded. <laughs> I've enjoyed our conversation. Yes, in fact, uh, uh, Sprott and Stansbury Research are co-hosting the 20th annual Vancouver Resource Investment Conference uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, third week of uh, July. I humbly suggest that it will be the best natural resource investing conference that your listeners could possibly attend. In addition to having famous editors and analysts from around the world, we will have the CEOs of many highly successful mining companies, including companies like Silver Wheaton, uh, Franco Nevada, El Dorado Gold, uh, Robert Friedland will be back. One of the things that I think really sets our conference apart from other conferences is the way we handle exhibitors. In most conferences, exhibitors are regarded as advertisement. And the qualification to be an, advert an exhibitor at most conferences is a pulse and a check that cashes, of course, in reverse order. Uh, for 20 years, our attendees have told us that they regard exhibitors as content uh, and that there is at least a tacit endorsement from the podium with regards to the exhibitors. So we've taken that to heart. And at the Sprott Stansbury Conference, if Sprott Inc. in its managed portfolios or for its own account is not a shareholder, the company is not allowed to exhibit. It doesn't mean that every exhibitor is ultimately going to be successful as a stock. What it means is that we know them well enough and we think enough of them that we have put our money where our mouth is. In our conferences, we have responded to our attendees and our exhibitors are content too. And it's important when you go to an investment conference to have the opportunity to listen to some of these highly successful people, people that have built, as an example, Franco Nevada from a 35 cent initial public offering to one of the most ex uh, successful companies in any industry in the world. People that have built Silver Wheaton, a brand new financing model for mining. Uh, the people who built these companies who still run the companies will describe the process of building those companies and teach investors the lessons that are appropriate to building a portfolio too. So we're very, very excited about this. Conferences like that are wonderful too in the resource sector and in the mining share uh, sector in particular because of the access that people have. It's so unusual. Uh, I mean, any other industry, if, if an average investor seeks to meet the CEO and have a 10 minute conversation informally with them, I mean, that, the chances of that happening are almost next to none. <laughs> so I applaud your efforts in this conference and, and I endorse it as well, too. I think that these kind of conferences are wonderful opportunities for shareholders looking to get to know management. Oh, wh what you say is very true. You, um, you put a face uh, behind the voice. And one of the things that happens is when you've had the uh, ability to meet personally the head of investor relations and the chief financial officer and even sometimes the chief executive officer, uh, when you call and visit with them, you are no longer sort of an anonymous shareholder. Uh, you get treated very differently in subsequent discussions when you've had the ability to have a one-on-one -on -one personal discussion. And I, I think that, uh, well, I want to thank you for bringing that point up. It's something that I didn't think to discuss, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing benefit for an active investor. Rick, it was uh, great to have you back. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, once again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for asking me interesting and intelligent questions. That makes it enjoyable. 
All right, Rick Rule, uh, the CEO of Sprott U.S. Holdings. Once again, for the doc and Eric Dubin, thanks for tuning in to this week's SD Weekly Metals and Market.